Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, M&T Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Dime Community Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance. Additional funding has been provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Avison Young, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citizens Bank, Cohen Equities, Colliers International, NYC, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, Handro Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Polsinelli, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, The Marinkoff Family Foundation, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Poland, Lower Manhattan, Williamsburg, Queens, Kew Gardens, the Catskills, the Soda Jerk, over here, Bryan College, the Navy. Now I'm going to work at First Investors. Now there's a business called real estate. Going to get involved. Going to get involved with industrial. Now I'm going to become the king of industrial. I'm going to own some real estate. I'm going to have my son start a career. Uh, Emery, okay, you know, we'll, we'll go out. Eddie Gordon, Long Island City. Today I have the kings of Long Island City. My friend Sandy Zuckerberg and his son Franklin Zuckerberg. Thanks for being here. Pleasure. Thanks so tell us me. the story of, of the family, how they arrived from Poland over here. Because we know one side came from Poland and one of them, they had been here for years, right? Actually, it was very difficult in those days for an entire family that didn't have money to come to the States, so they, and they had large families. So uh, my grandmother, and with her daughter and my father, and she had six children, uh, she left my grandfather in Poland, and she came to this country to get started. Meanwhile, World War I broke out, so there was a time difference, so they, it took them quite a bit of time to get the rest of the family over until after so, the war. So when did Grandma and Grandpa finally come over together? I mean, one came over like... Grandma Matthew came over said, first. Right. Grandpa stayed there with some of the older children, the younger ones, and one of my aunts and my dad were the younger ones, came over initially with my grandmother. Okay, so they, they come over and they settle on the Lower East Side originally. Right. Then they get elevated and move to Williamsburg. Right. Okay, so tell me about your dad. My dad was an attorney, immigration specialist, and uh, he was a very bright man. He was uh, very well respected in what he did. He was very involved, very, very involved in bringing uh, Jewish um, immigrants to this country just before the war and then after the war. And that was basically what he did all the time. And tell me about mom. Mom was a homemaker. She was born in this country. Her, her mother and dad both came from the Poland area as well, from Poland, as my father would call it, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. You know, who knew where, where it was, but they said Poland. So how did uh, mom meet dad? Blind date. 
Blind date. Back Something, in those days. It was blind dates or it was the society lunch, you know, uh, society luncheons or dinners that they would get. That's correct. But this was a blind date. So where were you born? I was born in uh, Brooklyn and grew up in Brooklyn until I was 13. And then we moved out to Queens. Moved out to Kew Gardens. Kew Gardens, Queens. Okay, so let's talk about growing up in Brooklyn at that time, okay? You, you're born in 1937. I'm sorry I'm telling the audience, but you, thank God you, you look good. Over thank here. you. Thank you. Uh, Feel good. And um, you said to me when we got together, one of your jobs uh, as a kid was a soda jerk? Mm-hmm. Where were you working as a soda jerk? Did, did you know how to make a lime ricky and... Uh, you know, first of all, there, egg cream? There, there, was an, there was a certain way of making an egg cream. <laughs> you know, you just didn't put everything in. And I learned how to make an egg cream. I learned how to sell cigarettes by the cigarette. We used to break up a pack of cigarettes. Yes, I made lime rickies. And uh, it was a very good experience in the summer times. And even after school, I used to work as a soda jerk in various places. Right. And besides the soda jerk, you know, this was the prelude of, we have to explain to <laughs> your, your son over here. We're talking about Starbucks, jerk and then it comes okay? to me. <laughs> they, 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 they had, uh, you know, they had, uh, the newspaper was always delivered. Okay. No, I never delivered the newspapers. No, 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 no. But they delivered the newspapers to the oh, soda. Oh, place. yes, yes. And you had to put the sections together. That's correct. That. That, that I did. Uh, <laughs> you uh, got yeah. good memory. Okay. <laughs> On that, that was an important thing, you know. Especially Especially Sunday, Saturday night, you know, picking up the Times and the news. You got the it. Let's talk about the Catskills. Okay. How, what what do you do up in the Catskills? Started off as a busboy, and I uh, elevated to a waiter, and uh, met a lot of interesting people. Had great experiences. Worked hard. You, and you stayed at the same Catskill Resort all, all those years. Yes, and uh, the the hotel, which was the Grand Hotel, was owned by the Tisch family. And many, many years later, when I was working for the Tishes on some real estate assignments, I would talk to Bob Tish and remind him uh, he would go, he would have so much fun now, relating now, you know, to that. You bring up a good point because few people realize the Tishes own the Laurel and the Pines That's in correct. Lakewood. That's right. And what happened was Lakewood was the summer resort. Uh, you know, and their other resort, as it was the Catskills, okay, they, they went, they transferred and, you know, they, they built an empire which became Lowe's and Boulevard, which some subsequently has some things. So when did you graduate high school? 54. I know, but where? Forest Hills High School. How do you find this college called Bryan College, a, a place where you can get your degree if you went for 11 months for two years? My dad was an educated man. He came from the Lower East Side. He said, and I, I didn't want to go to college at all. I wanted to just go out and work. And my father said, I went to college and you're not going to go to college? No, it doesn't work that way, Sandy. We, we came to this country so our children could advance. So he understood my position and he did a little research and he found on how he did it, but he found this two-year college in Rhode Island, Providence, Rhode Island, which I went to, which was one of the best experiences I ever had. And most of the students at that time were all uh, students who just had come out of the Korean War and they were looking to get an accelerated program so they can go to work, but they wanted a college education. And uh, I learned a lot from them. They were a little older than me, but I really did learn a lot from them. Now, you joined the Navy for two Correct. years. Where were you stationed? Because we have that picture of you as a, uh, what were you, a reporter or a... I was a journalist. A journalist. Journalist third class, yes. Where were you uh, stationed during those times? Initially, I was stationed in Bainbridge. Then, uh, for a short period of time, they sent me down to Annapolis, Maryland, where I had two jobs. I was a librarian uh, in, in the uh, morning, and in the afternoon, I was a lifeguard. And I knew that, that I would not, that would not last very long. And I met a very interesting chap there who was the journalist for the base. And he said to me, Sandy, you know that you're not going to stay this long, and you're going to end up peeling potatoes on a ship someplace. Let me help you. Help me, and I'll help you get a rating as a journalist. So I did some reading. He learned, taught me a little bit about photography. I did some writing. And the next thing I knew, I got orders. Then I was shipped out on an aircraft carrier, and I became the journalist of the ship there. And where did the aircraft carrier go? Well, it went uh, from Norfolk, and we ended up throughout the Mediterranean. Okay. So, so it was a nice uh, cruise. Was, but it was after the Korean conflict. Peacetime. Okay. So you come back, and you have your degree. You're a journalist. First Investors on 36th Street and Broadway? Yes. How'd that happen? Well, 
you know, very frankly, uh, you come back and you, you don't, in those days we didn't say, oh, I'll take a year off to find a job or something. So they were, they were relatively new in those days and it sounded like a good thing to do. So I was selling mutual funds at night while I was looking for a job during the daytime. And um, it served my purpose very well until I found the real estate. So how how did somebody who grew up in Brooklyn and then in Queens, who had really no involvement with real estate, enter the real estate field at a young age? I tried to go to the stock market initially, and because I was not ha, did not have the right pedigree, uh, all the good training programs and the sort of uh, good type of uh, Wall Street companies were not interested in me, and. I was very upset about it, but I started to do some research and I, I saw an ad one day for real estate investments. So investments, it wasn't so much the real estate, but investments. So I called this particular company and they were located in Long Island City. And I went down for an interview and they basically were industrial real estate brokers. I don't know why he was promoting investments. And, but the moment I saw it, I said, this is something that I think that I can relate to. And I took a job. Uh, the pay was terrific. It was all commission. And, uh, but uh, it was the right thing for me and obviously served me well all these years. So how did you and the other young Turk on 7 11 decide to go out on your own Sholem and Zuckerbrot? And also, how come you lost the course? <laughs> I didn't ask you. Did, was it a toy? Uh, a Quite twist, or we went alphabet or was alphabetical. alphabetically. <laughs> we went alphabetically. Right. But uh, Ron Sholem was working uh, as a salesman in the same office I was, and, and because we we had territories that we worked, so he worked the Brooklyn territory, I worked the Queens territory, and we realized that very often one particular account could have could either go this way or go that way, Brooklyn or Queens. So we started to work together, and we became very good friends. And we saw that we really worked well together. There was a lot of trust and we, a lot of respect that we had for each other. And um, we decided that it was time to, uh, first of all, I, I spoke to my boss and I said, is there an opportunity for Ron, Ron and I to get some equity in the company? He said, no, you boys will always make a lot of money here, but I won't share equity. So that was the message that we should go out on our own, which we did. So where was the first office? 2946 Northern Boulevard, right by Bridge Plaza in Long Island City, right where everything is happening today. That's right. But it, you know, it, it took a little while for Long Island City to explode, which we'll discuss when we start talking about Frank. But what do your parents have to say when you went into this entrepreneurial business at 25? You sure you don't want to go to law school? <laughs> so, <laughs> now, wasn't the story about the plumber? What was the, the plumber owned the building in Long Island City, and uh, it, was a, uh, it was a fourth floor little room that we had, and we had no money. And we were fighting with the owner, his name was Max Strauss, and may he rest in peace, and Max Strauss looked at us and he said, boys, he says, you're good boys, he says, I'm gonna give you six months free rent, and then you'll pay me my $75 a month. Get started. And that's how we got started. So you got started. Now, how'd you meet uh, Frank's mother? Blind date. A lot of blind dates. What is this? The blind date? A lot of blind dates uh, in the family. But they, you know, they all turned out pretty good. The, yes, they were very good. So you started. You and and your partner started a business. You created this business and grew. But something you said to me, which is important, I think it's one of the things that people ask me what they should do in real estate, is you know something. And I remember the movie. It was the Apprenticeship of Duty Kravitz. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Richard Dreyfus starred in the movie. Remember it well. He, and he goes to his grandfather in Canada, and Grandpa says, "Duty, you know, you could work for somebody, but if you own real estate." So you said there were three people in your life who were very influential in real estate for you, and they they put you besides being a leading industrial broker, but they talked to you for ownership. Tell me about the three people. Well, early on. Um, I had the opportunity of, uh, I was working on a deal with the Helmsley people, uh, Alvin Schwartz, who was a partner of uh, Harry Helmsley. And uh, when I was completed the deal, um, Alvin asked me, in those days I called him Mr. Schwartz, uh, asked me if I'd like to meet Mr. Helmsley. 
and this was really in my, my younger years, and I was very excited about it. And so he arranged for me to walk into Mr. Helmsley's office, which was very modest. And Mr. Helmsley was very gracious, gave me quite a bit of time, and asked me if I had any questions to ask him. And I said, there's been something on my mind for a long time, and I'm very happy that I have this opportunity, is everyone tells me you can either own property or be a broker. You can't do both. Somehow or another, I think that is wrong. Tell me, can I do both? And he says, you can if you manage it properly and do it the right way, and it's a very successful way of operating, and I commend you for your thinking. Go do it. So that was one. Who was, was number one. two? Number two, I had the opportunity of meeting Mr. Pritzker, A.N. Pritzker, the senior Pritzker. Pritzkers were the people who hired hotels and uh, numerous other things, but the Mormon group. That, that's right, and they owned this company, the Mormon group, which owned large uh, uh, companies, and there was the Cerro uh, Company that was located in Syosset, New York, as well as Massmouth, New York. Each uh, location had a half a million square foot facility, and they wanted to unload those. And they gave us the assignment of selling the properties, which we did. And then their, their real estate director said to me, uh, you really did a great job. Would you like to have the opportunity of meeting Mr. Pritzker? I said, yes. He says, uh, make yourself available one of these days. You'll take a, grab an early morning flight and go out to Chicago, which I did. And I, I spent about an hour or so with him, and uh, we spoke about a lot about his, um, his activities, his past. And he, like Mr. Helmsley, he asked me a lot of questions about, for me to ask him questions. And I asked the same question about owning real estate. And he says, as nice as it is to do brokerage, you want to own real estate. And Don't not do it. <laughs> and then, now let's go to the third person who, you happen to bring up the Tisch family from the Grand Hotel. Yes. The legendary Postmaster General of, New, of the U.S. The Bob, General. The General, Bob Tisch. Bob Tisch, I became very friendly with during the course of time that I represented him. He owned the Boulevard properties, and we, we uh, sold those properties for him. And uh, I used to- And you made a nice check, as you said. It was a good deal. Yes, yes. I used to go and have breakfast with him uh, at, uh, with, uh, in his Regency Hotel, and we, that was all the power breakfast days, that, those days. And he was always very proud that he had given me a large seven-figure check in those days, They're talking about many, many moons ago. And today it's still a very large check. And um, anyway, he also reinforced that thinking about uh, ownership of property. So now let's talk a little bit about the second generation of, of, of the business. You were born when? 1966. 1966. And where are you living at this time? Kid from Poland's <laughs> background now, okay? It's no longer in Kew Gardens. I think they were in a comfy apartment in Forest Hills that was good for, their, for, my, for them with, my, do with uh, my sister Renee, but once the family was growing, I think they recognized they needed a little more space and uh, the so suburbs were So tell me about calling. growing up in the suburbs. So we ended up moving out to Roslyn, uh, to an area called Country Club, and uh, you know, I had the typical Long Island suburban upbringing, and it was, it was a wonderful experience. Um, I was very fortunate uh, to be able to grow up uh, in a comfortable, safe environment. Back in those days, the kids used to be out from dusk to dawn. You had your bicycle, and uh, you, uh, we had a great time. It was, it was a great Now, day. the Catskills were still around. Did, did your father take you to the Catskills? I mean, once or twice with a couple of other families, we did some uh, Thanksgiving or right. Christmas holiday trips up, and we always had a ball. So how did you decide after graduating high school that you wanted to go to Emory? Well, back then, I uh, filled out a common application, uh, I think, like my dad, I knew I wanted to go to college, but I wasn't as focused at the time. And uh, I, my interests were elsewhere. I was very into computers back then. And uh, I think I put more focus into the computers than the college piece. But I filled out a common application and uh, got accepted to a few schools, Emory being one of them. And uh, we, with no expectation of wanting to go to Emory, we went down to look at the school. And I remember my dad and I went down and visited. And it was a beautiful spring. Um, and the campus was gorgeous. The weather was gorgeous. Coca-Cola had started investing a lot a of money. hot in the, in the summer. Uh, not on that, not, <laughs> not on that uh, day. Not that day. Uh, the, the campus was filled with a lot of uh, uh, good looking people. Uh, and, I, and also they had an undergraduate business program, which really was uh, a great 
uh, um, avenue uh, for me. Sandy, and so like take, my dad, I wanted to Did you take, take him around when he was a kid to some of the properties in Long Island oh, City? Sure. Oh, sure. He used to come work for me and mm -hmm. work in my office and do the various things. Oh, and, and how would I get paid? <laughs> Lunches. <laughs> oh, he compensated you rather well. Compensated me with a really good he lunch. You forgot about the, the labor laws <laughs> yes. over there. Okay. Oh, the, the office used to love when Frank was coming in. I was the best at collating and stuffing out. He would come and say, who wants Frank for the day? And it was literally, I mean. So the collating and your education, how did you get a job at Bennigan's when you were in college? You know? So um, interestingly enough, I have never had a salary job my entire um, working career, even from high school through college. Uh, I had initially worked at Crazy Eddie's. Um, that was in was, high school? I was in high school. Um, yeah, were you and, selling and uh, TVs? Or? I was selling computer equipment. TVs. Oh, so you were, you were on the geek squad. On the geek squad okay. side of it. But again, it was really a small base, but commission oriented. And then when I went to college, um, a lot of my friends were working waitering. And uh, so between doing some work study at college and waitering at Bennigan's, that's the way I came up with some of the spending money. My dad always had the Williamsburg in him and always wanted me to work for my own money. Uh, for spending money, and I was very well taken care of, and I had a lot of privilege, but uh, he always wanted to make sure that I found a way to get my own spending money. So you graduate uh, Emory when? 1988. So 1988, let's see, the tax shelter world had <laughs> gone crazy, I remember it rather well, okay? Me too. And, and uh, you know, so what do you do graduating? Well, when I was getting ready to graduate in the spring, a number of my friends were back you know, back then already they were starting to do the travel through Europe with the Eurorail Pass or friends that were going out to Colorado to ski for the year. And I remember sort of chatting with my dad about, I had the real estate bug already and I wanted to work in real estate, but actually not for Sholem and Zuckerberg Realty at the time for a variety of reasons. But I'd said to my dad, I'm, you know, thinking of, you know, taking a little time off. And he looked at me, he's like, get the job now. And when I was interviewing, I got offered a couple of job opportunities. And one of them was, you know, I came home in May and it was start in June. And he was like, take the job. And he obviously saw it was coming. Um, and although I didn't have that opportunity to have the fun, that would have been, you know, wonderful so to experience. So what was the job? I worked at Edward S. Gordon. I got a, again, just like him, the pay was great. <laughs> I was on a commission job. But you know, but you, I would not have gotten, I will, I will say I would not have gotten in, that job a year later. Okay, in, in the same manner as your dad was talking about Harry Hemsley, you know, uh, the Priskers and, uh, you know, the Tishes, uh, Eddie Gordon was a legend in his time. Absolutely. Okay? Oh, he but, really was. You know, I, I had some opportunities in interviewing, and, you know, obviously, uh, the company had a, a, a well-known name uh, in the city, so, um, you know, it, it's not like a generic name like Smith. Um, it's Zuckerbrot. So generally speaking, when I said Zuckerbrot, they would know that I came from a real estate family. So that created certain challenges because there was always a perception that yeah, I would end got, up at Sholem and Zuckerbrot. As opposed to being the leading industrial brokers, you got, you, you got into the office leasing model. Well, you know, my, my dad knew I was interested in Manhattan and, and knew I sort of had an interest in uh, the office leasing side of the business for a variety of reasons. And from his perspective, there was only one place to go at that time, it was Edward S. Gordon. He felt like uh, right. Ed was on the cutting edge of everything. His shop was on fire, it was growing, which it was. And through my interviewing process, he kept saying, if you can get an opportunity at Edward S. Gordon, that's where to be. And uh, we worked it very hard and very aggressively. And uh, fortunately, they gave me an opportunity because it really, sort of set the stage for my foundation. Um, and, and many of the things and many of my approaches to business today come from those early experiences Edward S. Gordon, including I was fortunate uh, to spend some time with Ed Gordon. Um, I was on a, a team with uh, him and one other person for renting out the Edward S. Gordon space at 200 Park Avenue. So they had some extra space and I would handle the subleasing of that space. And I would have to report to Eddie Gordon and a gentleman named Tony Santinides at the time. So, Ed Gordon was not easy to work for. So when do, you, <laughs> when do you say to him, it's about time he can come to work for you? What year is that? Well, I never said that to yeah, him. Yeah, and I had no intention of working. Never said that to Frank. Abroad. Even through the summers I'd spent there, my dad had a, a partnership with a number of different uh, people involved. And after spending a number of summers there, I felt that the dynamics would not be good for me um, and, and possibly even long term for us. So we really never focused on that. So when I focused on a different so path. So when did you join the company? I joined in 1993. 
um, about a year after the company essentially split. Correct. So uh, the year prior, um, uh, there was a changing in the partnerships and basically at the end of the day, my dad had control of the Long Island City office and that was an opportunity. And uh, we started talking about, you know, what if, and um, I was in a great place in my life. I was single at that point and I could really take some chance. And my dad um, really had a big interest in the retail side of things as well in the early 90s. He felt like the retail, chain retail uh, business was going to come to New York City in a big way and thought that we may have an opportunity to participate. And you did. You, you became did. the, uh, basically the reps for CVS. We did, well, we did a lot of work with CVS. Right. Um, and but we, we ended up doing a fair amount of work with a number of chains that were growing at that time. So if you think of Blockbuster and CVS, uh, Rite Aid, Genevieve's Drug Stores, right. Um, food industry, all these chains that were really led the way um, in the outer boroughs. And, and we became active and grew that part of our business and in the 90s. And then you became active in ownership, I mean, in a number of properties. We did. Okay, you know, especially the Home Depot before its time in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Right. You know, and then the the Swing Line building, which everybody can't miss when they go to Long Island City. Oh, yeah. Which, and you also have that small little Shalom Zuckerberg sign over there. <laughs> How'd you meet your wife? Um, I met my wife um, up in Vermont skiing. I was friendly with her sister. Her sister wanted to set us up. What, was it a blind date also? Um, I, I don't know if it was a blind uh, date. I mean, the blind dates over here. It was a version of a blind date, but we were all together. <laughs> and um, my wife's a, an excellent skier and loves uh, outdoors, and that's a passion so, of mine. So let's talk about family, okay? Yes. You have a sister. Yes, Renee. Renee, okay. Older sister. a literary agent. Yep. You have two children, right? Yes, I do. Edward and Ava. Okay. Uh, Ava is 16? Other way around. Okay, 16. right. One just got his driver's permit. Yes. Okay, and Ava is going to be bar mitzvah. So... You know, it's fortuitous that you didn't stay in the first investor's world, okay, <laughs> or, or publicity, because I think what uh, Shalom and Zuckerberg and basically uh, Sandy and Franklin have done, have built a nice little dynasty. Maybe one day, uh, you know, we'll see if... Uh, Edward. Uh, Edward <laughs> or... Or Ava. Or, or, or Ava want to go into, you know, in the business. And thanks for being here today. I appreciate it. Thank it's our, pl it's our pleasure, and thank you for having us. Enjoyed.